Good morning, everyone. Uh, very excited to be the first group to be presenting for our Warrior Athletic Growth Series. And our group, we talk about health and wellness. So that's the topics that we'll be talking about all semester long. So I'm going to screen share already so we can see what's going on with our presentation, which can you guys all see? Fantastic. Um, if I glitch for whatever reason, just wave and let me know if I need to repeat anything. Um, sometimes have issues with my internet. And then uh, as far as any questions go, if you guys have any questions that you wanna put in the chat, we can um, go over them at the end of the presentation and we'll answer any questions that you guys might have at the end of today's presentation. So today's topic is mental health and social media. And my awesome group, consists of Dake Walden, head athletic trainer, Gary Hogan, athletic trainer, Joey Guzzo, strength and conditioning coach, and Mallory Gibson-Rossi, head women's volleyball coach. Recent trends of time spent on social media. Social media has become an integral part of people's daily lives and routines. Some are addicted to it so much that it's the first thing that they do is they wake up and check their social media feeds, and I can honestly say that I am guilty of that. On average, global internet users spend two hours and 23 minutes on social media per day, though trends differed widely by country. Some countries show signs of plateau, so as you can see this chart on the right, um, and it can be driven by aging populations in these countries. During a typical day in Japan, people spend less than an hour staying connected digitally. Germany shows slightly higher numbers with users going on social media just over an hour every day, while the UK and the US both spent closer to two hours per day engaging with social media. And if you look, the Philippines, they're averaging about four hours a day on social media. So where is everyone spending most of their time? This graph here was a study done from July 2019 to July 2020. Um, and so as you can see, Facebook is where most everyone is spending their time with over um, 2,500 people on average going there. And everything in order, YouTube and WhatsApp, they're around 2,000. There are a couple that have some asterisks next to them. So Facebook Messenger, um, they haven't reported their updated figures within the last 12 months, so the numbers might be a little bit off. With Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter, they report to a third party, so their figures might be off as well, but not by much. So what are people getting from social media? Mostly news and entertainment. Staying up to date with news and current events, it's mostly most commonly cited reason for using social platforms and with the COVID-19 pandemic, it has accelerated the global trend of relying on these sites for information updates. Recent events have given more social elements of social media with a new lease of life. So this slide and the next slide, um, it's looking at social media during the pandemic. And I'm going to break down every age group that we talk about um, with these next two slides that this study was done on. So Gen Z, the ages are 16 to 23, and the base study for that age group was 37,418 people. Millennials are ages 24 to 37 with a base of 64,945. Gen X, ages 38 to 56 with a base of 57,866, and then baby boomers are ages 57 to 64 with a base of 15,316. So the first chart is filling up spare time uh, on social media, and it looks like Gen Z is the ones that are spending the most time with 32%. Millennials are at 26%, Gen X at 23, and baby boomers at 19%. To find funny and entertaining content, Gen Z again with 31%, Millennials 27%, and Gen X 23%, Baby Boomers 19. 
staying up to date with news and current events, it's almost equal across the board, but the biggest group is our Gen X with 26%, and then baby boomers and millennials 25%, Gen Z is 24%. So staying up to date with current events, not as important to Gen Z. To stay in touch with what my friends are doing, uh, almost equal across the board, but baby boomers are the highest with 26%. Our Gen X and millennials are at 25% and then Gen Z with 24%. To share photos and videos with others, the highest group is Gen Z, 28%. And then we have 26% with our millennials, Gen X with 24%, and then baby boomers with 22%. And up next, we have Joey. There we go. I forgot that I was muted. Um, all right, thanks, Elizabeth. So I'm going to talk about some positive aspects of social media, which aren't necessarily what we think about with social media, but there are some. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so to me, these seem of a, a common sense uh, type of approach to trying to make your social media experience a, a positive one. Um, some of that includes just filtering your notifications, uh, each separate app, you know, you can turn off those push notifications so you're not constantly getting bombarded with, uh, with people that you follow or who follow you that comment or doing like that. And, you know, removing those negative influences that you do follow. If people are posting things that you constantly disagree with, you basically just hate follow them um, or hate reply to them. So just just remove them from your from your list or Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, whatever other ones are out there. But I think that'll just you know ease the burden of, of trying to make this a positive experience. Um, Dake will touch on some of these things a little bit later as well. So I'm not going to try to rain on his parade too much, but. Uh, you know, try not to just post things just to post them, you know, have a reason to post something um, so you're not disappointed in getting a few number of likes compared to your friends who may have posted something similar or um, your followers aren't keen on or caring if you brush your teeth uh, in the morning. So don't post things, just post them, you know, put your content out there uh, to be more uh, personal. And then uh, don't use it when you're feeling sad or depressed. Uh, there's a lot of those feelings out right now based on being stuck at home. So we've, as Elizabeth alluded to, spending a lot more time on it. So finding uh, other ways to occupy our time um, instead of just being glued to our phones. Next slide, please. So there are positive uses for social media. Um, I think the first one is really important. That first number one with the three bullets of peer to peer connection. Um, and that's kind of cross-generational, as Elizabeth showed us. That's, uh, you know, from every age group, especially right now, being able to stay connected to everybody. Um, and the, the apps are, in their simplest form, pretty user-friendly. So they're not really isolating one group or another. Now, there's certain things, obviously, you can do uh, more on one app than another. And people are, are good at those. I'm personally not. But uh, in the simplest form, just being able to stay connected to people. And then getting the ease of information, like as Elizabeth talked about, especially now, um, with all the different changes in, in the COVID reports, uh, healthcare, um, sports highlights, unless you're a Jets fan like myself and you haven't had a sports highlight uh, since social media actually started. And then um, I think the biggest one is advertising, both in, in products and then in job creation. Um, it allows people to capitalize on their creativity. Um, so there's a lot more advertising, marketing jobs. Obviously, most universities have them as well. And then uh, community engagements. Um, I think Facebook's probably the biggest one for that one in terms of finding groups and interests to, uh, to become involved in, whether that's volunteer, special interest groups, uh, things like that, and following that information as well. And then uh, one of the biggest impacts, I think, uh, from healthcare, uh, from social media is healthcare and social media. And obviously this study was 2013, so you can only imagine that it's probably expanded now that 80% of Americans are seeking their healthcare information via social media. Um, so that's probably more your Twitter and your Facebook and that, you know, 70% of these organizations back in 2013. So again, probably increased now. Um, we're using social media for a community engagement, uh, fundraising opportunities, patient engagement, and just disseminating information. Um, we can just get a wide variety of healthcare information now that may save us a trip to the doctor uh, to be able to self-remedy at home or give us a better idea of how to treat loved ones or understanding what's going on with our health. 
And then, um, you know, the patient and physician use is, is doctors being able to connect virtually with patients, you know, telemedicine, saving us that trip to the R with, with, every, with everything such a time cruncher and our, and our things, if things are closed or not be able to leave the house, um, being able to do telemedicine is a huge, huge benefit. And then patients can now do their own research. There's a lot of Facebook groups for specific doctors or specific causes um, or injuries, illnesses that people can do their research and connect that way and, and feel um, connected with each other if they're going through and sharing their stories, um, whether positive or negative stories, but in this case, obviously positive stories of, of good treatment, good doctors, um, great care facilities, what have you, and you can make a better in, informed decision about your own life. And then obviously you can't go talking to social media without talking about its use in education. Um, in terms of social networking, just the proliferation of information, specific group designed for specific information. Um, again, I, I'm in a ton of different Facebook groups just in coaching in general, whether it's from a specific sport to an organization, um, and that, that leads to improved communication. That allows us those group threads to share ideas. Um, in the case of education and schools, emergency alerts, if you're on the same platform, um, we've had a lot of those, unfortunately, throughout our time. So being able to keep everybody safe is a huge aspect. Uh, media sharing, that would be like YouTube or what we're doing right now, just that ease of access to create this kind of content and share it with people and help us uh, stay connected and learn. And then the, the, there's an app for everything. So you can collaborate more easily, whether that's WhatsApp, GroupMe, um, all those, uh, Slack is another one where people can stay connected and, and share information more easily. Instead of having a million text threads, you can organize your thoughts uh, more easily and collaborate and discuss. And obviously for education purposes, group projects, teachers staying connected with students, um, that's huge. So those are all the main aspects of uh, the positive ways we can use social media. And I'll leave it to Gary here uh, to talk about the negative impact of social media and our mental health. Okay, thank you, Joey. Uh, well done. I'm here to talk about the negative aspects of social media. And uh, so when this all started, the, about the uh, first piece of information I could uh, come across was a website called uh, helpguide.org. And it it's, uh, uh, provides a lot of information, both positive and negative aspects of social media. And so I, uh, as I've read through the negative aspects, I narrowed it down to these five areas right here. Um, inadequacy about your life or appearance. And comparing your life to others. Uh, fear of missing out, something I've always known existed, but I've never heard it called FOMO for short. So, um, and then isolate, isolation leading to uh, depression and anxiety, uh, self-absorption, and then extended blue light screen time impact. So these are the areas that I'm gonna focus on. But before I even move on to that, I just wanna talk about a, a quick survey that was done by the United Royal uh, Society United Kingdom's Royal Society for Public Health that surveyed uh, 1,500 teens and young adults, and they uh, scored how they uh, they scored them or they surveyed them um, on uh, five different as or five different types of social media to uh, um, kind of uh, figure out which one uh, what which forms of social media had the uh, biggest impact negative impact on their mental health. And so the results kind of looked like this. Uh, Instagram was actually considered the worst form of social media for impacting uh, mental health, uh, followed by Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, and then YouTube was ranked actually a positive uh, um, form of uh, social media on mental health. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the uh, first area, inadequacy about your life or appearance, comparing your life to others. Uh, this started off with a uh, article entitled Social Comparison, Social Media, and Self-Esteem. It was written by Vogel et al. in 2014. And uh, what he uh, determined was uh, self-esteem and relative self-evaluations were lower when the target person's profile contained upward comparison. So that means if you're looking at your own profile and then you look at somebody else's profile, uh, you know, um, how does it affect your self-esteem? Is it, you know, can it impact it negatively uh, if you look at it and their profile actually looks better to your, better than yours? And when I'm talking about something like, I like to take Airbnb type vacations. It's, uh, we've always uh, kind of prided ourselves on uh, finding unique locations and, and homes and things like that to kind of stay in. And then, but, you know, if I were to 
look at what I do, and then all of a sudden I get back and I see uh, somebody taking somebody else I know taking a uh, a vacation in the Maldives or something like that, and all of a sudden I'm like, ah, shut up. Oh, that's kind of a blow to my self-esteem. Not that that really happens. That's just kind of an example of what can happen um, in, in that situation. And I can, so I can see that. Uh, another study, the role of social comparison and the use of Instagram among emerging adults. All right. This was written by Peta Stapleton et al. in 2017. Um, and uh, what she found was social comparison on Instagram actually mediated the relationship between uh, contingent self-worth and self-esteem. So again, this is just another example of people that are kind of comparing uh, profiles to one another, and now it shows that it actually mediates that relationship between self-contingent uh, worth and self-esteem. And then finally, uh, on this area right here, reported by Best Day Psychiatry and Counseling, uh, they, uh, they showed a survey of uh, 1,500 British adults who used social media. And nearly two thirds of them said they felt inadequate or jealous of others after springtime. So those are some of the areas of how uh, social media can impact your mental health due to inadequacy about your life or appearance, especially when, you're, when comparing your life to others. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, fear of missing out. Again, I, I mentioned earlier, that's a term that I've, uh, I've, I've known for a while. Um, it even goes back to a conversation in my household uh, you know, uh, that my wife and I had. Um, our family tends to spread out through the house. Uh, you know, our, my wife will be in one room doing her thing, I'll be in another room doing my thing, and then you know, our daughters are in uh, their rooms doing things. But we have a, a, a dog, a little Yorkie Chihuahua mix. Some of you have seen him before. He goes from room to room to room and hangs out with uh, different people for, for various times of day, and it's, it's almost like he's trying to pull us all together. But my wife asked why, I said, well, I think he has the fear of missing out. It's almost like, he, he wants to go from room to room to room to see what he's missing out on uh, with each person. Uh, so that was, you know, that's kind of how I saw it at the time. But um, I want to talk about an uh, article here uh, entitled Fear of Missing Out and Sleep, Cognitive Behavioral Factors in Adolescents' Nighttime Social Media Use. This was done by Holly Scott and Heather Woods. And... Uh, Basically, what it did is it questioned 101 adolescents uh, on their social media use. Um, and the results that they found with this is they had a fear of missing out that disturbed sleep by, number one, it delays uh, sleep time. Okay, you're up a little bit later because you're afraid of what you're missing out on. And when you're up a little bit later looking at this, it increases your pre-sleep cognitive arousal, something I call busy brain. Um, you know, it's uh, just kind of get your mind going, and then it's hard to fall asleep after that, which leads to longer sleep onset latency. So, um, and then that number three there leads to number four, a shorter sleep duration. Okay, well, that's just one way that uh, that, that FOMO can affect our uh, uh, it can affect our mental health and our sleep negatively. Um, one other thing. Now, this was a new term to me called uh, thudding. Okay, and this was done by Franchina et al. in 2018 in an article entitled, Fear of Missing Out as a Predictor of Problematic Social Media Use and Fubbing Behavior Among Adolescents. All right, uh, this was done in Belgium, um, and they, uh, they actually surveyed uh, 2,663 adolescents in this, uh, in this study and found that uh, FOMO, the fear of missing out, leads to fudding. Fudding is ignoring companionship in order to pay attention to your phone. So we're going to see this, you know, sometimes uh, in social situations. Uh, you see it, you know, um, in, in restaurants. Um, you know, a group of people sitting there having dinner, and there might be one that's just constantly on the phone, ignoring everything else that's going on directly in front of them as well as, uh, you know, sometimes in the classroom, sometimes in our own meetings. Um, but again, FOMO leads to fudding, which is ignoring the companionship, which right there in front of you and around you in order to pay attention to your phone. Uh, and there was another article done by Fang et al. in 2020, where they studied uh, 501 Chinese college students that actually supports the previous study by Franchina et al. in 2018. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, 
another negative uh, negative aspect of social media on mental health is isolation uh, leading to depression and anxiety. All right, again, this was reported by uh, Best Day Psychiatry and Counseling. Um, and uh, this comes as a result of a survey done by Scopes Digital Detox Survey that found nearly 30% uh, admit they actually feel lonely when they are looking at social media. And then in a study uh, entitled Social Media Use and Social, sorry, let me start again. Social Media Use and Perceived Social Isolation Among Young People in the United States. This was done by Primec et al. in 2017 where they surveyed 1,787 U.S. adults. And what they did is uh, they actually used two factors here. One was a time factor, and the other one was a frequency factor. And so those who spent more than two hours a day, that's your time factor there, had two times the perceived isolation than those who used uh, social media less than two hours a day. Uh, and so for the frequency, more, those who uh, had more than 58 visits per week to social media had three times the perceived isolation than those who had less than 58 visits per week. All right, uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Okay, self-absorption. Um, self-absorption was listed several times as a negative uh, aspect of social media. Um, it was really hard to find good numbers, good research on it. Uh, so this was the best information I could find. Um, this uh, article was done, this article was called, Check Your Selfie Before You Wreck Your Selfie. All right, personality ratings of Instagram users as a function of self-image post. Okay, and this actually also compared selfies versus posies. And so what they did in this study right here is they took 30 undergraduates and they had them complete uh, Instagram posts and they, screened, they screenshot them for the second phase. So the first phase was, uh, uh, so I got caught off guard there by the, uh, the chat question that popped up. The uh, uh, first part of it was, was to take those 30, um, 30 Instagram posts and screen shoot them. And then what they did then is they presented them to 119 undergrads from a different university. And they were able to actually uh, rate several different attributes of these 30 Instagram posts. And what they found was, is those who were, those who had, a lot of selfies are those, they, this is how they viewed the selfies actually. They viewed the people who posted selfies as self-absorbed, less likable, um, having less self-esteem, being more lonely, being less dependable and being less successful. Where on the other hand, on the positive side of it, uh, those who took more posies were posted as having more self-confidence and being more likable. So, okay, uh, final slide please. Uh, my final slide, that is. And then uh, the, uh, the last area I want to talk about is uh, how uh, social media use negatively impacts you on the, an area of extended blue light screen time impacts. So this information comes from uh, UC Davis Health and Counseling. Um, a few years ago, I think a lot of you might remember this, we had a, uh, a gentleman named John Underwood, uh, Human Performance Project, Life of an Athlete. He came out and spoke to all of our athletes. And uh, one of the things he addressed that night was uh, how blue light is affecting our sleep patterns. So that wasn't new, necessarily new information to me uh, at this time as it decreases you know, your sleep hormone, melatonin. Um, it increases your alertness, obviously. And I think that leads back to you know, busy brain. It resets the body's internal clock, all things that can affect sleep. With new information to me coming out of this, uh, this piece that I read here from UC Davis shows that it can actually damage your retina as well. So I was unaware of that, but um, that's just one of the physiological factors that could be a negative aspect of, uh, of social media, which I think in return can also um, over time affect your uh, mental health. But that was my area, negative aspects of, uh, of social media on mental health. I'm gonna turn it over to Mallory now, who's gonna talk about uh, how, that, how, how, how it becomes a cycle. All right, thanks Gary, good job. Um, so I'm going to talk with you about the vicious cycle of social media use. Um, excessive social media use can create a negative self-perpetuating cycle 
Um, so research has shown that excessive screen time and social media use acts as a digital drug and it creates that negative self-perpetuating cycle. And there are four cycles to this vicious cycle, uh, or sorry, four stages to this vicious cycle of unhealthy social media use, which usually starts with um, feelings of loneliness, maybe depression, anxiety. And as we experience those feelings, we tend to go to social media as an outlet. And as we use social media more, um, our FOMO increases along with feelings of dissatisfaction and inadequacy. Um, and then as we have those negative feelings, it affects our mood and can lead to depression, anxiety, or stress. And those worsening symptoms cause you to use social media even more. Um, and then that vicious cycle just keeps repeating itself. So I will now go into a little more depth on each of those four stages. All right, so the first stage is that emotions are the core driver of social media use. When you feel lonely, depressed, anxious, or stressed, you use social media more. This has become a coping mechanism for many of us. Um, you know, we tend to grab our phone and without even thinking about it, we start scrolling through social media to relieve ourselves of maybe the stress that we're feeling. Um, we also have the tendency to go to social media to relieve boredom um, or to feel connected with others. And I think as humans, we innately seek those relationships and connections with others. Um, and social media provides that platform for us to do just that. Um, during the pandemic, we have lost the ability to have in-person connections with others. Um, so one of the few ways to fill that void is through social media. Um, the second stage is that um, the more screen time increases anxiety and we're going to watch a short video real quick. Um, it just kind of shows us the reality of social media and what it can do to us. All right, so obviously this video is meant to make us laugh, but at the same time, um, it is reality. And a lot of people feel um, the need to make it seem like their life is perfect or they have everything together. And um, many people experience this, especially 
uh, people between the ages of 14 to 24 years old. And that's the bracket that our student athletes fall into. So um, I think it's something that we should pay, should pay close attention to. Um, so using social media more often can lead to um, the following things. So feelings of inadequacy and dissatisfaction. The majority of people post their highlight um, or their very best version of themselves, just like we saw in the video. And then we compare, or we think that's their norm, and we compare our behind the scenes um, life to their highlight reel. Um, a couple of weeks ago, things were pretty hectic for me around the house. Um, my husband was, uh, or both of us were going back to work with the student athletes and um, my three-year-old was sick and then my newborn is a stage nine clinger. Um, so I just wasn't able to get things done around the house. Um, things are getting kind of messy and um, I was on social media one day and saw um, this blogger with um, a picture of her and her family sitting around the dinner table. Um, their house was spotless. And then I started thinking like, am I not doing a good enough job? Um, should I keep things clean around the house? And I just realized like how quickly I fell into that trap. Um, and again, you just feel like you have that pressure um, to feel like you have everything together 24-7. Um, um, using social media more often can also lead to a fear of commitment. So many people um, have a hard time making a decision because they don't want to miss out on another opportunity. So instead, they just don't commit to anything at all. Um, the next thing that increased levels of social media use can cause is increased levels of FOMO. Research has shown that 70% of millennials fear they are going to miss out on something marvelous happening somewhere where they're not. Um, I'm sure that we've all experienced similar feelings at some point in our life, kind of like maybe Gary was mentioning about the Airbnb. Um, but the reality is that we often um, serve ourselves a steady diet of FOMO. And when we do, we um, just kind of mindless, mindlessly swipe and click um, and binge on our devices. Um, finally, the more screen time results in, excuse me, in feelings of isolation. Um, an example of this is when you're on social media um, that your friends got together without you. Maybe you were or weren't invited, but for some reason um, you couldn't be there with them. And so you feel isolated. And it's those kinds of feelings um, that make you feel like you're in high school all over again, but now it's on a platform out there for everyone to view. All right, next slide, please. All right, so the third stage is that all this anxiety puts us in a negative mood. Um, studies show that when screen, or that screen time affects the frontal cortex of the brain, similar to the effects of drugs. Um, there is a high risk factor with too much screen time as excessive stimulation from screens affect your dopamine levels, which is that reward chemical of your brain. Um, if it's firing too much, you can become addicted to it and increasingly need the activity that gives you the high. If you don't get that dose of screen time, you could have withdrawals, which triggers those bad moods. Um, it's kind of that pleasure reward that um, causes those negative outcomes for our day-to-day -day life. FOMO and feelings of inadequacy, um, dissatisfaction and isolation worsen as the symptoms of depression, anxiety, or with the symptoms of depression, anxiety, and stress. Um, as you scroll through social media, you tend to compare your life, whether intentionally or not, to the pictures and videos you see. And it's that comparison that is the thief of joy. And when we spend hours on social media comparing our life to others, it's likely going to put you in a poor mood. Um, and then as Gary talked about, exposure to blue light causes poor sleep, which leads to sleep deprivation. And I don't know about all of you, but when I am sleep deprived, I am not usually in the best of moods. So that is also a big factor. Obsessive behaviors cause things like jealousy, envy, and bottling of emotions. And those repressed emotions get built up and turn into depression. Next slide, please. All right, so the final stage of the vicious cycle is that worsening symptoms cause us to use social media even more. Um, those feelings of depression, anxiety, and stress, um, dissatisfaction, and FOMO cause you to use social media even more in an attempt to relieve your boredom or to find that connection with others. 
And so that downward spiral just continues and it repeats itself over and over. And I think during COVID, it's as if we can't escape our screens, um, work, entertainment, visiting family, um, doctor's appointments, school, um, leisure time, fitness classes, just everything is all on our screens. We have to connect through our screens now. And so it's important that we give ourselves time to unplug, which is why I'm going to now pass it on to Dake so he can share some solutions with you. Thanks, Mallory. Good morning, everyone. With the understanding that the usage of social media is very individualized and varies greatly from person to person, my part of the presentation is going to list several generalized approaches to explore as solutions to improving one's own mental health while spending time on these platforms. Ultimately, it will take a trial period of time for each individual to identify which approaches work best for them. The first approach one might take would be to limit when and where you use social media. Using social media can interrupt and interfere with in-person communication. You'll connect better with people in your life if you have certain times each day when your social, social media notifications are off or your phone is even in airplane mode. Commit to not checking social media during in-person time with family and friends. or doing other scheduled activities such as during periods of studying or while working out. Another approach to consider would be to stop social media from replacing real life. Tweeting with a colleague can be engaging and fun, but make sure those interactions don't become a substitute for talking face to face. Social media can be a useful addiction, a, a, can be a useful addition to your social life but only a flesh and blood person sitting across from you can fulfill the basic human need for connection and belonging. Again, focus on making the change of separating in-person time from online time as opposed to a combination of both. Another approach might be to schedule regular multi-day breaks from social media. Several studies have shown that even a five-day a week-long break from Facebook can lead to lower stress and higher life satisfaction. Consider challenging yourself by setting goals of different lengths of time to be off social media, but also identify potential self-reward options for achieving those goals. You can also cut back without going cold turkey. Studies show that using Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat just 10 minutes a day for three weeks resulted in lower loneliness and depression. It may be difficult at first, but seek help from family and friends by publicly declaring you're on a break. Pay attention to what you do and how you feel. Experiment with using your favorite online platforms at different times of the day and for varying lengths of time to see how you feel during and after each session. Take notes, or better yet, make a list of those feelings that you're experiencing and assign a numeric value to them in order to, in order to help you identify if extended time or different times of the day play a role in improving or worsening those feelings. You may find that a few short spurts help you feel better than spending extended periods of time scrolling through a site's feed. Also note that people who use social media passively, just browsing and consuming others' posts, feel worse than people who participate actively, posting their own material and engaging with others online. Whenever possible, focus your online interactions on people you also know offline. You will find more enjoyable, engaging moments by being able to continue a dialogue in person that originated through social media. Approach social media mindfully, ask why. If you look at Twitter first thing in the morning, think about whether it is get informed about breaking news you'll have to deal with, or if it's a mindless habit that serves as an escape from facing the day ahead. Be honest with yourself. Each time you reach for your phone or computer to check social media, answer the hard question, why am I doing this now? Decide whether that's what you want your life to be about.
It is not important to post three or four times a day. Post when you have something to say. Posting many times a day could lead to undue pressure, but also loss in the quality of content. Just reflecting on why you're posting, why you're choosing to share something with everyone out there, and why you're putting something out in the public domain is often quite telling. What purpose is your post serving? And is your post accomplishing your intended purpose? Be authentic. Believe in yourself and that your brand is you and a reflection of your values. Being genuine and true to ourselves can be refreshing and can ease off pressures that we might be putting on ourselves when deciding when to support the, val the views of others. So one challenge that we came up with was to delete all social media apps or get an app to monitor the time on social media and keep it below 30 minutes a day. I think it's important to set, set goals on, uh, on adjusting how you're using social media. And I think it's also important to reward yourself when you do accomplish those goals. So that's just uh, one little challenge we came up with. I'm sure there's many others. Again, this is a very individualized approach. It's going to take some time on your part to kind of explore uh, the different options um, to kind of, you know, find a happy medium between your use of uh, online time and uh, real life experiences. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Elizabeth and uh, I think uh, she'll finish up and we'll answer any questions. All right, I'm going to check the chat. Um... So does anybody have any questions for us? Thanks for listening. I have one question going back to Gary's um, talk. The, um, where he talked about Instagram being the most negative. Did it say, did that study say why Instagram would be on top? Okay, there we go. I'm unmuted now. Um, no, I didn't say uh, directly why, why. What they did is they had, uh, let me go back to my notes here. Um, so they surveyed 1,500 young people and had them score five different forms of social media in uh, several different areas. And so uh, when it came back uh, through those seven different areas, they didn't really give a breakdown on it, um, but it just showed that, uh, that the, uh, um, Instagram was the worst, and more likely by uh, by comparison. But I guess that was just the way it, how it affected their well-being. So, uh, and so uh, right here, yeah. So five different forms of social media, and uh, on fourteen different areas of their well-being. So, and then they just gave the results. And so that particular article Aaron. it wasn't there wasn't an article related to it this came from um actually came from united kingdom's royal society and public health but the information was presented on a website called best day psychiatry and counseling and so they just threw out that very brief information right there without going in depth on the uh, on the study itself i actually looked for information on the study but couldn't find it so <laughs> thanks gary sure um, and then we have some questions in the chat. Um, one is, can you suggest an app that monitors social media specifically, not just screen time? Also, do you have suggestions for those of us that use social media extensively for work purposes? Um, I don't know if, Dake, if you happen to have seen anything in the solutions of apps that monitor your screen time at all. I haven't explored uh, different apps um i'll have to check into that um i think i can i can answer uh, morgan's question as to the pressure of having to be on social media because i feel the very same way as, as he does if, uh, our current situation the pandemic working from home i find myself waking up in the morning thinking okay i need to get, get this 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 and this done uh, then i go check the emails i have to respond to them 
I'll try to get things done. And by the time I know it, I've gone through the day and I've gotten nothing accomplished that I intended to to start the day. So what I've done recently, just to kind of combat that, is actually set a timer. Uh, when I start getting on emails, responding um, to that, or any Facebook or LinkedIn um, contacts, I'll set an hour limit. And when that, the timer goes off, then I spend what I call me time, go outside, work in the garden a little bit, take a walk, so on and so forth. So uh, again, like, like I said, it's very individualized. I think you just gotta, you, you have to uh, come up with different ideas that work for you. And going back to Gabe's question about the app, um, I think there's a couple, well, I'm sure there are a few, um, but there's one called Hootsuite. Um, I think Google also has another one that you can use, um, but it'll monitor like the time and, um, yeah, so I, I'm sure there are a lot more, but those are the two that I know of. Uh, to comment on Morgan's, uh, Morgan, I feel that all the time, that, you know, you got to keep up with the Joneses, post about your program, uh, like you have to, you know, you don't want to be like the one program that's not keeping up with all the, oh, we all vote, or we all do this, or we all do that. You know, you want, it's, it's, uh, it's very, uh, it puts a lot of pressure on us social media wise. I feel that just to keep up with the, all the other programs that are doing it. I think a good approach to that, like feeling, um, having to always post or keeping up, like you're saying, um, Coach Trev, that schedule things out, which it might seem like daunting in your time, but like Sundays is usually like our family downtime, things to get organized for the week. So for me, what I have going on for my week, I look ahead, I got my planner, Monday, it's, I have this scheduled at this time and I just basically you schedule things out so you don't feel like you're constantly having to do all the social media, the stay on top of it, the answering text messages, the emails, because I get it. I'm the same way too. If someone, I have an athlete texting me about something, an injury or a bill or something like that, but like Dave was saying too, setting time, a timer or time so that you're dedicating that time and even letting like your athletes know or others that you might be working with, like, hey, I'm available from this time to this time to emails or questions or in-person calls. So then that way you're dedicating a specific time, whether it's every day or every other day, so that you're not having that constantly having to be on social media um, every 20 seconds so that you're seeing what's going on and liking someone else's posts or um, uploading information about your program as well. And I want to respond to uh, Morgan really quick, if I can, too. So, Morgan, you say sometimes you feel the pressure to have to be on social media. Do the positives outweigh the negatives? Um, you know, if we take a look at uh, some of the information that, that Joey presented versus the information that myself and, uh, and Mallory present, I, I think that's what you have to do is you have to look at those factors. And then even Dake mentioned, uh, have a reason to do it. Have a why as to why you're, why you're going on or, or why you need to look at it or uh, when you post. Uh, why are you posting it? And uh, so I, I think the big thing is, is you have to look at those positive aspects and, and focus on those as being a reason while you go on. And uh, even if you catch yourself falling into some of those negative aspects, like I'm talking about, if you're looking at it because you've got a fear of missing out on something, uh, you know, if you start to look at things, you, you, may, you may be looking at another coach's Facebook page and saying, wow, he's, he's got things just a little bit better than I do over in that, in that situation right there that's where you kind of got to limit yourself and, and, and cut yourself off, but focus on doing it for all the right reasons. So the positives can outweigh the negatives if you focus on the positives. I mean, it's a quality versus quantity issue, in my opinion. Like I'd rather see three quality posts and 30 posts about, like Mallory said, the same thing. And then if we're constantly posting on social media, we're just driving other people to look at social media and we're just continually falling into a cycle. So like, if you have a reason to do something, do it, but don't just, it's also the mindset in which you're doing it. Like if you're doing it to compare yourself to other programs or other people, then you're probably going to find yourself in a really negative mindset when you're posting or doing it more just to feel like you have to, as opposed to saying it like I'm doing this as a positive impact on my program and my university. Um, so just have their mind, I think just have the right mindset when you're doing it. If you're in a crappy mood and you find yourself on social media, you're probably going to feel crappy about posting things and comparing yourself to, Oh, well this program has this. So now I feel like I have to post this 
And so like you may think that you're posting it for the right reasons, but really you're just posting it as like a comparison reason. Um, so I think just having the mindset of knowing when you're on social media and understanding why you're on social media um, is a kind of an important issue. That's why I just remove everything and try not to say anything. And two, uh, to kind of tag in with this, there's this great uh, documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. And it kind of, when you're talking about negative and positive posts and stuff, it kind of goes into detail of how these big corporations monitor what you're looking at. So if you're looking at a lot of, you know, politics and negative stuff that's going on, it's going to flood your account with the same kind of posts. And so it's like, you're trying to escape it, but then in the, in the instant, like in the same time, it's like, you know, just going to give you more of what you're looking at. And so kind of just be aware of that. It's pretty cool. I, I would suggest to watch it. It's, it's good. So it'll change how you think about your interaction on Facebook or whatnot. Well, thank you everyone. Um, the, the first presentation of many great ones to come. So if there aren't any other questions or comments, make sure you're reading. So there's some really good stuff in the chat too um, as well. I, I think we addressed everything, but you can always hit us up on the side too via email if you need to, if you have more questions about the stuff that we presented on today. But otherwise, thank you guys for taking some time out of your day to listen to us. Real quick, awesome job. I think, thank you. I think it's really tough to be the first group on this. So you guys did a, a really great job um, kind of kicking this off for us. So excited for the future ones, um, which I think we have one next Thursday. So good job, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Now go outside and run around. Get off your phones. <laughs>